Welcome to the Rocky Mountain MS Center's webinar series, Maximizing Lifelong Brain Health in MS. Today's topic is accessibility in your community and beyond. This presentation features Michelle King, CTRS and the Program Director of the King Adult Day Enrichment Program, KDEP. Michelle received her master's degree in therapeutic recreation from Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. She has experience working in community recreation, residential, and with individuals with MS. Michelle has worked as a certified recreation specialist for over 15 years. This webinar is scheduled for one hour. The first 45 minutes will be the presentation. If you missed something on a slide, we will be archiving this webinar on our website, www.mscenter.org, so you can replay it at any time. We'll reserve approximately 15 minutes at the end to answer questions from the audience. Please submit your questions throughout the presentation by typing them into the chat window on your screen at any time. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. With that, we'll turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, accessibility, the definition in and of itself, is the quality of being able to be reached or entered, the quality of being easy to obtain or use, and the quality of being easily understood or appreciated. So accessibility is not just about physical accessibility, but also space, language, hearing. So referring to phys physical space, curb cups, ramps, elevators, also to the language that's used, hearing and reading, signs and adaptive devices that are available in public locations. Accessible transportation. Locally in the Denver area, there are numerous wheelchair and other adaptive devices, accessible cabs, and companies. There are also privately held or publicly funded, including the RTD's Accessoride vans. Privately held companies are often paid out of pocket, and most common involve cabs, Uber, and Lyft. Most cab companies offer limited wheelchair van access, not only in the Denver metro area, but in cities across the U.S. Uber and Lyft have recently started special services for the disabled community, but are in the very early stages of that expansion, and so those programs may not be available everywhere you go. Medical transportation is paid through a Medicaid waiver if pre-approved. Medicaid can provide a complete list for non-medical transportation and medical transportation as a separate entity. This is true in local areas as well as in other cities across the U.S. You can ask for assistance by calling local Medicaid offices, and they can provide you a listing of all services available in their town. Accessible public transportation. So most major metropolitan cities have a paratransit service with their bus and or light rail lines. Paratransit is three categories of service according to the ADA. Not all bus lines in all cities are accessible, but calling ahead or checking online for maps and information can ensure you get the right, on the right schedule. In Denver, we're lucky because all of RTD's bus and light rail um, train cars are 100% accessible. There is never a time when there's not an accessible vehicle en route on one of their lines. Part of the ADA or the assess uh, excuse me, Americans with Disabilities Act is to provide access to public transportation. That paratransit system requires an evaluation or an assessment for both the physical and cognitive aspects of all disabilities. Paratransit categories, <clears throat> there are three. The first category is an individual who needs assistance from someone other than the bus driver at least part of the time to get on and use the system. Category two, someone who can use the accessible bus independently, but they are not on a route with an accessible bus any or part of the time. So in Denver, they may have, be on the route, but they cannot get to it 100% of the time independently. Category three is an individual who cannot get to and from the regular bus stop at least part of the time. So fatigue is a big area where people fall in category three because you may get somewhere but then may not be able to get back from the bus stop due to fatigue. 
applications for paratransit are dependent on the local transportory, transportation system authority. So in Denver, it's RTD, and you go through an RTD accessor ride pass that is scheduled at on-site at the Easter Seals location, but every city has someone who has the authority to grant that right to ride paratransit. So RTD in Denver, the buses and the light rail are all accessible. With an accessor ride ID, you can ride in the city or the light rail trains free of charge, and you can have an attendant ride at a reduced rate, as long as you are on the public part of the transportation system. Accessoride vans are required by law to provide door-to-door -door service and require that ID that is obtained through the application and interview process. They have a reduced fee, but they require three days in advance of scheduling. You cannot call today and expect an accessoride to pick you up tomorrow. If there's availability, they may make that accommodation, but they are not required to. If you would like to have an attendant ride with you, you have to fill out a separate application for that attendant, and you must prove that there is a need for someone to ride with you at all times. Air travel. All major airlines allow passengers with assistive devices to load first. You can opt to have the airline or the airport assist you with a wheelchair, either your personal one or one that the airport has on site through the airport by informing the airline at the time of booking and or checking in. I found if you tell them when you're booking and when you check in that you're going to need assistance, then they will maintain that assistance throughout your travel that day. Um, an attendant will push you through security and assist you to your departure gate. If you're capable, they will ask you to stand out of the wheelchair so that they can check the wheelchair as they do all things moving through security at this point. If you cannot, that is fine. They will allow you to stay seated and they will wand the chair and your person. Uh, one word of caution is if you have a gel cushion, they will need to take the cushion off and it will not be x-rayed, but they'll actually have to do the swab test, so it will take longer. So think about what you want to take, and the same things apply to your equipment that would apply to what you can carry through on carry-on luggage. So if it's a gel base, they're going to need to test to make sure that there's nothing in it that would cause harm. Upon arrival at your destination, so once you've, you've reached the city or location that you're going to, they will have a wheelchair ready to assist you to baggage claim and or ground transportation. Generally, they unload the rest of the passengers first and then bring the accessible chair into the plane to get you so that you can move through without, without as much crowd around you as possible. That jump? While you're boarding the, the plane, a transport wheelchair is a wheelchair that is designed to fit down the aisle. Most of them don't have arms. They're very narrow. They're about as wide as the aisle is itself, so you can think of the um, meal cart. That's about as wide of a chair as you're going to get but it will wheel you down to your seat to allow you to get into your chair without having to walk down the aisle. Any personal assistive devices, a power wheelchair, manual wheelchair, or walker can be loaded into the belly of the plane, and that can be done from the gate. So they will take your equipment as far as they can. Your power wheelchair is obviously not going to board the plane with you for you to get into your chair. They would transfer you to that transport chair and then they will take it down the same way they take um, strollers and car seats through to the belly of the plane and load it. Um, it is not a perfect system. Sometimes they do, there is damage to your chairs. You can get a manual wheelchair bag um, similar to a car seat bag for transport purposes that then it can be zipped up and protected in. If you're going to do that, they ask that you check that at the time of checking baggage and then use a, one of the airport's actual chairs to get you to the airplane. Many groups offer specialized vacations, not just for those with MS, but for those with disabilities. There is an MS Cruise for a Cause, which is an educational one that occurs every year through the MSAA. You can also find a travel agent who um, specializes in adaptive travel. On the screen, you'll see one that I found that was for the U.S., and it's a link of a whole bunch of different travel agents so you can figure out who you want to work with. 
and this is all just in the U.S. This next slide has the listing agent for Europe. I could not find any that were specific to South America, Mexico, um, Australia. Most of the U.S. travel agents, though, are capable of helping you make plans for visiting foreign countries other than Europe and including Europe. You just have to tell them ahead of time where you want to go and what kind of equipment and assistance you're going to need once you get there. To rent equipment, most major cities have companies that will rent or loan you equipment to use while you're visiting. Most of those companies are going to be social service companies, um, sisters of charity, some hospitals will do it, wheelchair companies, um, specialty to that city also have loaner equipment or rental equipment that you can check out. So if you don't want to travel with your power chair but you know you want one in town, uh, you can call up ahead of time and say, do you, do you have a connection with someone that has a power wheelchair that I can rent or borrow while I'm visiting, um, giving your specifications? You will need to do that at the time you schedule your travel. If you wait too long, that equipment may not be available. The sooner you know that you're going to need to rent it, the sooner you will have a better option of getting the equipment that you need. Most accommodations in hotels are going to be accessible. They'll either have accessible rooms or accessible spaces. Airbnbs are most likely not accessible unless you ask ahead of time as it is a private residence. Hostels, most likely not accessible, um, tend to have more narrow doorways, and steps, and small bathrooms. Bed and breakfasts are also most likely not going to be accessible. If you need accessible space, you're probably going to have to go with a major hotel chain. Hotels are required to be accessible under the ADA unless registered as a historic landmark, and even some registered as historic landmarks have adapted part of their space to be accessible. You need to ask for an accessible room. What you will get in most accessible rooms is a roll-in or low-lip shower. They will have bars in the bathroom. They'll have accessible toilets. Most of them can also provide a sharp container if you need one for your syringes. They will not have a lift to get you in and out of bed, and they may not have a bed cane. Some of them may be able to help you locate one in the area if you ask ahead of time. But if you're thinking about renting equipment like a power wheelchair or a hospital bed or uh, even borrowing a manual wheelchair for use while you're in town, you should ask that same location if they have one. And most often those are going to be a Hoyer lift, which requires cranking and a sling by the individual helping you. It's not going to be the easiest, most efficient system, but it is the only thing that is going to probably be available. That said, most hotels will have the potential to have an accessible pool lift. You can ask. Some of them you won't see it on their site. Some of them you will find it actually there, and they just need to wheel it out into placement for you to use. Um, any hotel that has a pool will have staff trained on how to get that out and use it so that they can teach you the various methods. Several styles exist, some that are hand cranks, some that are easy up-down buttons some that the controller can be wet, some that the controller can't be wet. It's always best to ask questions so that you can get um, answers ahead of time. If you want to stay in any of the other options, you'll need to ask a lot of questions ahead of time. Think about anything that you do in your day and how you do it in a regular day and ask a question about it. The major ones that people um, sometimes forget to ask are, are there steps to get in and out of the building? If there are steps, do you have a ramp? If they don't have a ramp, is there a portable ramp available? If it steps in, but once you're in the building, it's pretty accessible, you might be able to rent a ramp and have it delivered so that you can use it while you're there. You just need to know how far the distance of the steps are, how many steps, so you have to think through all of those questions to be able to ask ahead of time. Is the bathroom accessible? Sometimes people think their bathrooms are very large and accommodating, 
but they're not large enough to get a wheelchair through the doorway. Or there's not enough room for a bar. There's not enough room for two people to stand in there comfortably so that someone can assist you if you need it. Um, ask about standard doorway size. Think about how wide your wheelchair is. Standard wheelchair width fits through a standard door. If your wheelchair is larger because you're taller or more narrow, you might have different needs and you need to plan ahead for knowing what those sizes are so that when you call you can ask questions. Sightseeing. Most of us go on vacation to see things that we don't get to see from home. Historic sites, cathedrals, famous houses, museums, informer houses, which is popular a lot back east, are most likely going to be only be partially accessible both in the U.S. and abroad. House sizes have grown over many generations. Text the website, call and ask questions. If they tell you it's accessible, ask if it's partially accessible, fully accessible. Um, know if that means that you're only getting into the gift shop, if that means you're getting onto the patio, if that means you can get into the first floor but you're not going to get to see the second floor. Ask how wide the doorways and walkways are through if you're going on a tour in a house. Um, a lot of people want to see those historic homes but forget that those homes were built with more narrow dimensions. Once you put furniture in the way, you may not be able to move it. Moving your wheelchair or walker through a space that is tight may become cumbersome and fatiguing, and so you may not be able to get all the way through. Um, walking tours in the grounds may have uneven surfaces. You might have a paver sidewalk, which in theory should be flat, but over time the bricks and the paver stones start to shift and settle and it might create a lip that would be a challenge to get over using an assistive device. Even just walking with a cane or not, not being able to tell the difference to that uneven surface, you may trip. So really thinking through how do I navigate at home? How might I navigate traveling in very temperatures, humidity conditions, what is the vision like? Is it low light, high light? Am I going to trip and fall when I enter this space because the ground is uneven? Um, can you fit two people walking side by side? Never would have thought of that prior to my years in this field. Sometimes having someone beside you can mean all the difference in your mobility, and that can mean that you can't fit through a doorway together and you have to think about how to maneuver. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of people like to use rolling walkers as a seat, and those uneven spaces and uneven grounds, if the walker hits that right, the walker can collapse. So you really need to think through, do, should I just use a wheelchair for this in order to conserve energy and potential harm to myself or those walking with those uneven surfaces? Uh, museums, art, history, science, nature, they're most likely going to be fully accessible if run by a city or state government. The challenge may be that uh, elevators are small and may only fit one or two wheelchairs at a time, may fit one wheelchair and one person, may require some flipping of the wheelchair around on the inside in order for the doors to close, um, may be in spaces further away from the exhibits that you're really interested in, and so you need to plan for that. Walking time, if you're walking with a walker or a cane, and how fatiguing that might be. Most places you can find a map, as well as um, elevator locations on their website. Um, planning ahead and looking at that map and thinking, am I going to be close enough to get there? Do I need to plan to have a place to sit? Is there seating in the hallway? Is there going to be a line to get into the exhibit once I get there? Is the exhibit narrow and winding so that I have to backtrack lots and I might get more fatigued with that walking? Are there audiovisual aspects? 
that might cause me to have mobility issues. If the lighting changes, if it looks like the floor drops down. Um, most often in art exhibits or science exhibits where they're talking about um, spatial awareness, you might find those happening. Aquariums might also have that effect with the water reflecting onto the floor and it looks like you're going to step off. So thinking through looking at websites ahead of time will be a huge um, benefit to you in thinking about your vacation. You'll be doing a lot of pre-planning, but you'll find that your vacation may be much more enjoyable because you'll know what you're getting into ahead of time versus getting there and having frustration. Zoos, most of the zoos have accessible spaces. New feeding stations may or may not be accessible, so there's a new trend in feeding giraffes and um, having space where you can walk above animal exhibits. Those may have ramps, they may be steep, they may not have a ramp at all, they may be willing to have a zookeeper assist you at a lower level feeding a giraffe if they have a smaller giraffe where they can bring them over. All of those you kind of need to call ahead and ask. Um, I know that most zoos when you look at their maps are accessible, they have ramps somewhere. Sometimes you might take a ramp in and then hit the far end of the exhibit and discover a set of stairs and then you have to backtrack and come back up the same ramp. Um, so you need to think about, is that walking distance going to be too much? Is there a place where I can stop and rest? Most of the time there's a bench handy or somewhere that you can rest in between if you need to. Um, most zoos will also have manual wheelchairs or scooters that you can rent. They may go quickly. You may need to schedule ahead of time. Um, the analogy that was told to me by a professor once was think about going to Disney World and needing a stroller. A lot of parents think my kids are going to get through this entire trip without that stroller and then they can't and they rent them at the last minute and there aren't many left. The same thing will happen with wheelchairs and scooters. They're going to have a limited number and if it is a crowded event, they may not have one available for you at that time. Concerts and cultural events. A lot of concert venues have accessible seating. Most concerts, sporting events, cultural facilities, you will need to order online these days unless you're going to the ticket window in person. If you're calling on the phone, you need to ask for what handicapped seating options there are. Internet orders, you should look at the seats based on selecting the handicap symbol. And if there is an option to limit to what's available based on handicap access, you need to do that. Handicap wheelchair spacing may not have the option of someone sitting directly beside you for the event. You may have to have your loved one or friend sit in front of you. Generally, it's directly in front. It might be off to the side. Sometimes they bring out a folding chair and put it in the space all things to ask. Um, in a cultural event, the seats are generally going to be closest to the performance or on the outside edges. You need to be aware of whether or not it's going to be something that comes to the edge of the screen. And if they're coming to the edge of the screen, you may not want to sit all the way up front and you may need to ask if there's going to be seating off to the side so that you don't have your neck bent back while looking up the entire time. They generally are closer to the performance because there's a larger open space available for movement. Sporting events have accessible sections as well. Sometimes they're on the walkways, so just at the top of the seats. So if you picture a baseball stadium, most of them are at the very top, right before you start to walk down to the seats closest to the field. That is also true for football sometimes for hockey and soccer. So you're going to be sitting right at top of that first level, generally not all the way at the top, somewhere in the middle. And those events you're also going to have to ask for accessible seating or choose it. The location depends on the venue. Some venues have it only in one or two sections. Um, first base, third base line, but not center field. Sometimes they're all the way across that entire open span. Again, your loved one may have to be sitting in a folding chair or there may be a space 
where you can pull a wheelchair in and have it right next to. Um, ask lots of questions. Think ahead lots about what you want to do and how you want to experience, how many people you're going to have with you, um, what your needs are. Planning close proximity to bathrooms is sometimes a good idea as well. So looking at the seating chart and being aware of where the closest bathroom is um, so that you're not fatiguing yourself by walking all the way down. Sorry, I thought my slides jumped on me. Technology, um, there's a cool smartphone app, wheelmaps.org, helps you find places that are suitable for wheelchairs worldwide. It is a public forum app, for lack of a better word, which means that they get their information from places that individuals tell them are accessible. So it's kind of like Wikipedia. Not all information may be correct. It may be correct for that individual, um, but it should give you a basic idea. And they have a code for what's accessible. Green is 100%, yellow is partial, red is really not at all. The images show up in that um, color system, like the stoplight showing you where you, where you shouldn't, shouldn't go. Um, it's a great tool to use during planning. It's also a great tool to have on you while you're out in the community. Smartphones make things uh, so much easier for us as we're navigating. However, the developers themselves say it works better on an Android device than it does on an Apple device. And that if you need to, you can use their website for the information. However, our website is going to require data or Wi-Fi use to connect. So thinking through, do I need this? Maybe I can get the directions in a friendlier way, save the information to my notes section of my phone prior to going out in the community if you know that you've got an Apple and it's not going to work, work as well. Recreation, my passion. Most fitness centers in a community are going to have accessible areas and restrooms. Not all are going to have trained staff. Recreation facilities and communities may or may not have a therapeutic recreation specialist on staff. If they do, they are most likely under the heading of special needs um, or adapted rec recreation. Those individuals could help you figure out what equipment is accessible, how to use it, where the lifts are, how the lift works. Um, but those staff may not be available at all hours, so if you're thinking of going into a recreation center, calling ahead and asking some simple questions may save you time. You may find out that at 6 o'clock on a Thursday night, there's no one available to help you with that, and so you need to rethink whether or not that's a valid time for you to go. Parks and recreation. Most or some parks and open spaces will have paved walking trails and accessible restrooms. The restrooms may not be open year-round. Most often are not open late fall, winter, and early spring um, when they are less likely to be used. An accessible trail could be crushed gravel or concrete, which is that fine, gritty texture, which in theory is accessible unless it's been raining or snowing and there have been um, rivets dug into by the, wa the water flowing away from the surface. So thinking ahead about whether or not you've got someone who can help you move your wheelchair or walk her through those dips, which may become impassable. Some places will list if they have a paved walkway, and paved generally would mean concrete or asphalt, and that would be smooth, a smooth surface for you to traverse. <clears throat> It helps to think um, about distance and awareness of how long can I go before I'm going to get fatigued because open spaces and parks, not all of them have chairs or benches space. So again, that pre-planning and having lots of questions, you can check their facility map on the website to see maybe they have a smaller loop that you can walk, maybe there's a larger one, but it shows that there's several benches along the way so that you can have a seat. Um, if they have 
Um, porta potties or outhouses, are they accessible? Some are and some are not. Um, closer to a major park system, you probably are going to have greater luck finding accessible parks than you are in a smaller community. Adventure. Adventure is anything outside of the date in my mind. So skiing, snow skiing, water skiing um, is one example. Several organizations have staff trained available to assist you. In Colorado, we're lucky enough to have NSCD, which is National Sports Center for the Disabled, BOEC, Breckenridge Outdoor Education Center, and the Crested Butte Ski Resort. Um, all of those facilities have accessibility equipment and staffing. Sometimes you need to plan ahead and schedule. Most cases, if you want to go skiing for a week and you're going to need some assistance, you need to sign up online ahead of time for those ski staff to be with you. NSCD is going to have a variety of outdoor activities year-round. They have adapted sailing, rafting, horseback riding, mountain biking, I'm trying to think of all the ones I've done. There are adapted ropes courses. Um, Breckenridge Outdoor Education Center also offers a variety of activities, including the skiing, but then also all the other ones that I listed for NSCD. You can get all of their information and sign up through checking their individual websites. Um, they have tra staff trained in answering all of the questions, and they will probably ask you a million questions about yourself, including how much you weigh before signing you up for their event and that's to make sure that they have the equipment that will work best for you. Crested Butte Mountain Resort also offers adapted recreational activities through their adapted sports center. Some um, of the things that I saw listed for Crested Butte also include recreation center use, so they might have um, a wider variety of indoor activities as well. Nationwide, Easter Seals organization offers a variety of activities based on location. They often have camps that are designed for not only children, but there's also adult specialized camps that you can sign up and go and spend time. Some require an attendant or family members to be with you. Some of them allow you to go and experience it on your own, and they have the staff to assist with personal needs, as well as all of the activities for you to participate in. Accessible communication. Most museums and historical tours offer sound or audio tours for your needs. Sometimes they're in Spanish. Some, you know, if you have, a, you understand Spanish much more fluently than English. Um, sometimes they just go at a slower pace. Sometimes they match the sound that's being piped into the room, but is loud enough so that you can hear it. They may provide a handheld recording so that you can follow and stop and hit re replay, giving you information. I've seen them in our exhibits where they talk about the artist so that you can get a little more understanding of what it is, the artist's conception of what's happening. Also in nature and science museums where they explain the exhibits more thoroughly, since most often there's a plaque uh, with generally small print to describe what the display is for and how what the meaning behind it is. So you can always ask at the time of check-in and ticket purchase. Some facilities will have translation services available. Not all of them will have translation capacity. That could be a foreign language. That could be sign language. Um, I know that a few of the, the local museums have sign language interpretation as a volunteer, so that person may not always be there. You can check in advance and ask if someone with sign language is available for your loved ones so that they can experience um, the exhibit in the same way that you are. Accessible accessories. I think it's important to remember that when you're using an accessible device, you might want to be hands-free you might need to have somewhere where you can store um, your various odds and ends. So considering the use of a wheelchair or walker bag on a 
wheelchair, a backpack, works great to slip over the handholds if the wheelchair has it. And not all power wheelchairs have those, so you might need to think of a different kind of bag, a drawstring that would have anything that you would need for the restroom, but it would also have hand wipes, water, place where you could store any souvenirs that you purchased, or a hat for when you're outside, sunglasses, so that while you're trying to navigate inside a space, you aren't worried about your personal belongings. Um, there are many sizes and types available. Um, manual wheelchairs, you can sometimes find nice sleeves that fit over the armrests. Those are also popular for walkers, where they can hang in the front. You can have it open into the walker, which is toward you, versus being available on the outside. Some of them have zippers. Some of them have zipper pouches on the inside of another zipper so that your personal belongings are more secured. Um, there are many different types out. If you're going to be outside, consider a water bottle bag or one of those uh, straps to hold it to your assistive device so that you can stay hydrated without having to worry about jumbling that and maneuvering at the same time. Um, all of us need to make sure we have our stuff around us and it's hard when we're trying to move ourselves and our equipment with our hands full. Some handy tips for traveling. Carry a letter from your MS specialist or physician stating what your needs are. Have an MS ID card from the center which talks about symptoms and a, a little proof of that the fact that you have MS. Um, some Airlines and hotels and other places will make, go out of their way to assist you if you can prove to them that you have something wrong that needs their assistance. So if you're getting fatigued, showing them that you're fatigued versus having slurred speech from alcohol might be a good way for you to help smooth that pattern of, I need the assistance, this is what I have, this is some explanations of my symptoms. Creating a travel bag ahead of time, and this is a travel bag that you would carry with you day to day. You might have a spare credit card, backup medications and toiletries in case you can't get back to the hotel or where you're staying. Having a spare set of medications with you, toiletries in case there's an emergency, um, anything you might use daily, you can fine tune that over time. Often I find that it's easier if you're using one of those larger, like a backpack where you might need a sun hat, some sunglasses, water bottle, ID, copy of an insurance card. If you don't want to carry the entire, the real insurance card, having a copy handy. Um, having a medication list um, in case something happens to you, someone can look in there and see what medications you're on and they'll know how to treat you a little bit more thoroughly. Um, and having that as up-to-date as possible will also help for someone who does not know you provide the care that you need at the time. Uh, you can do that also with a medical alert ID bracelet, but having something on you or in your possession at the time may aid. Um, make copies of all of your travel documents and leave those at home with a trusted individual, leaving your flight times, your confirmation number, um, hotel that you're staying in, any tours that you're going on or any locations you're going, so that if someone needs to look for you, they have, someone at home has that same information. It also helps that if you lose something while you're traveling, you can call that individual and say, can you give me my confirmation number for my flight home just so I can write it down, or a confirmation number for a tour that you scheduled or the time, so that you have another way of doing it to prevent stressing out over something as silly as misplacing a piece of paper, which can happen to anyone. Um, pack a variety of clothing layers. I know that's a big thing in Colorado, but it's true anywhere. Having a lightweight jacket that's wind rain proof, um, having a hat, having thin layers of clothing you can take on and off, no matter where you are, inside or outside, the temperature varies based on humidity level, number of people in the facility or location, time of day. You may go to an afternoon baseball game and think, I'm just going to be fine because it's like 95 right now and I'm wearing this t-shirt and shorts and the game goes extra innings or you're waiting for your ride back and it takes longer and you're freezing. The reverse could be true. You go out first thing in the morning, you're wearing a little bit thicker clothing, by the time you get back in the afternoon, it's 
so hot that you are sweating through and you don't have anything else um, to cool yourself down with. Plan around the heat of the day. I know we talk about this a lot. Plan your activities. So if you're going to do something outdoors, think about doing it in the morning or later in the afternoon after the hottest point of the day has happened. Um, plan for that hydration need while you're out in that really hot time frame. Pace yourself. Don't think you need to hit all five places that you want to go in the first day. Leave room for naps and re-energizing, even if it's not actually sleeping. Taking time to rest and sit, have a snack, have a drink. Um, all of those things will help you enjoy your vacation a little bit more. Ask for help, something that we all struggle with. If you're tired and you need help, or if you're confused or lost or frustrated over a situation, ask if there's someone available to help you. Ask for directions to the nearest restroom. Most often, people will step to the plate and give you assistance that you need so that you can enjoy all of that time. Um, in the two previous slides, I said have a letter from your MS specialist. It's always nice to actually have their contact information, too. The reason you want to do that is if you have an exacerbation or a pseudo exacerbation and you end up at a, an emergency facility, they may want to call and speak directly to your physician and ask questions about your normal presence so that they can see what kind of care you need and support you in the best way possible. Um, it's also important to have an in case of emergency list for family or friends who the, the emergency personnel can call. Take a buddy. If you don't have a family member that can go, find a good friend. Even if that good friend has MS2 or a disability, you can still take a good friend. They know you. They're going to sense changes. They're going to help you keep calm and enjoy the trip because they're going to they're going to sense when you need to sit slow down. Plus, if someone is with you and they want to slow down, it's going to remind you, hey, maybe I should take a little break right now, and you can enjoy things. Know where the bathrooms are. <laughs> Always know where bathrooms are located. Um, even if that means when you walk into a building saying, oh, look, there's a bathroom right by the front door, store that for later. As you pass one in the hallway, oh, there's a bathroom, store that for later. Just having the awareness that you might need that restroom at some point. Use any and all equipment available. When possible, take your own equipment, especially for wheelchair seating purposes. Your wheelchair, if you have purchased it and gone through a wheelchair company, is going to have the right type of cushion, right type of back support, right length of footrest, right orientation for your body at all times. If you're using a loaner piece of equipment, be aware of how that cushion feels. Be aware of how you're sitting in that chair and its comfort level. Knowing that you might need to get out of it for a little bit and sit and enjoy something else will lead to a better enjoyable day. You don't want to go on your vacation and end up sitting in an uncomfortable position on the first day and powered through and the second day you can't get out of bed because everything hurts. Think about shifting around in your chair. If you're sitting in a wheelchair, lift, lift up and shift. Um, do some stretching in your seat. If you have a cane that you can collapse and use as a secondary device in a restroom, have that with you so that you can always have something in case the bars aren't in the right location. Um, if you need a walker, take the walker. Airlines will accommodate equipment, and you can always borrow equipment that is bigger at the location, but you will want to have something that you're familiar with to help with navigation purposes. Um, plan all contingencies. Think it through. You don't need an itinerary. Give yourself time. Limit what you want to experience in the community and how you would like to enjoy that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. We're going to switch over to the question and answer portion of the webinar. You can continue to submit questions into the chat window on your screen. Um, will we give you guys time to put in your questions? We did have um, a question that came up in the registration. Um, do you want to go into a little bit more about uh, organizations in the Denver metro area besides Accessoride? 
that can provide transportation to events, exhibits, plays, etc. Um, most commonly in Denver, you're going to get Metro Yellow, which is now one joint company, Metro Yellow Cab Company. They are now housed in one facility, and they both have wheelchair vans accessible. Um, if you're calling for a cab, you need to let them know what your needs are ahead of time. So if you're going to a concert or something and you need to take your wheelchair, let them know that you have a collapsible manual wheelchair that's going to need to go in the trunk. Or if they can bring a wheelchair van, um, which they have a fleet of so that they can have it, let them know how many people also need to ride in addition to the equipment. Um, I, once upon a time when I was a green newbie, um, watched someone schedule a ride for myself and two individuals with MS and two other people and their equipment, and they did not tell the cab company, so they sent a cab for five of us, thinking that there were two people who had wheelchairs that might need assistance. So not just yourself, account for everyone and everything that you're taking with you. Um, most cab companies, um, especially in the accessible fleet, will allow for a return pickup time to be slotted ahead of time, um, which will help on the way home from a sporting event or play so that you're not waiting forever for somebody to come. Um, most of those companies are going to give you a window. In particular, Accessorite is about a 30-minute window, but you have seven minutes to get in their van, which is a really short period of time. So if you know the event ends at 8, I would not schedule a 7.45 to 8.15 pickup. You need to really think about scheduling an 8.15 to 8.45 pickup to give yourself that 15 minutes to get to the bathroom and outside so that when they show up, you're ready to get in the vehicle at the same time. That is also true for those other transportation companies. They may not wait. Um, most likely you're going to have better success going through Accessoride or a yellow metro system than you are through a, a different private company for that. Excellent. Did we have any other final questions before wrapping up? I had a couple um, that came in. I talked a little bit about how airlines deal with the motorized wheelchairs getting in. They will sometimes disconnect the battery. I didn't say that earlier. Um, so when you get it back, you just need to make sure that the battery is turned back on. They will also disengage the wheels. So if you have a power wheelchair, you most likely know how to disengage. But if you don't know how to disengage your wheels so it's in push mode, you should ask. They will also allow you to take your charger um, as long as it's clearly labeled as a charger. Think about how you want to label that and what you want it to be like. If you have a removable cushion or anything on those chairs, it's best to remove those ahead of time and put them in a separate bag so that um, it isn't lost in, in the actual transportation piece of getting it back to you. Um, we talked a little bit about hoists in hotels, and that's really a Hoyer lift option. The other, group, the other question that was sent to me was, are there any groups that would like to host adult mentors for youth that also provide transportation? The challenge is uh, liability in most of those settings. So under some of the Medicaid waivers in the area, um, there are waivers for Medicaid waivers for DIDD, which is um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Some individuals with MS are served on that waiver system. They often do a one-on-one -on -one, um, or community integration aid that will provide transportation. You can sometimes contract with an ILST for services. You can also talk to local universities about mentorship from some of their programs and they will uh, allow for mentorship in the sense that they'll allow a student to work with you. They may not provide transportation due to the liability piece, but if you were using the paratransit system, you might be able to have them ride with you as long as you set that up ahead of time. Excellent. Thank you for sharing this helpful information on accessibility and your time with us today. Uh, after we close the webinar, you will see a short survey. Please take a moment to let us know your thoughts. And you can find additional MS education resources on our website at www.mscenter.org.
www.ghostdocs.org. Thank you.